All right, so in this video, I'm going to talk about the CVT on a Yamaha BWIS and how it works and, of course, how to tune it. Okay, so on the CVT in the front, we've got the variator and that's attached to the end of the crank. Um, and at the rear, you've got your torque driver and your bell, which is attached to the gearbox input shaft. And of course, in the middle, you've got a belt. All right, so in essence, how a CVT works is very similar to a bicycle chain and a derailleur system. Effectively, you've got um, units that control the diameter of things. So for example, you've got the belt, it sits in the, the V of the variator and in the V of the torque driver. And then you just vary the diameter of either side to engage different gears. So for example, when you're in first gear, because these things do indeed have a first and a second gear and kind of something in between. So when you're in first gear, the belt is riding at the very outer edge of the torque driver and at the very very center of the variator so kind of in that area there you can actually see that kind of circle there that's basically first gear and that's where it will idle and it'll kind of um, obviously get a lot of wear in that area and then the next kind of principles to which they work is is how they vary their diameter so on the variator side you've got rollers and i'm sure everyone's familiar with rollers it's uh, these little suckers here, and I've got a very light roller there. You can see how big that the hole is in the center. Um, I've got a heavy roller there. You can see the hole is quite tiny, so much heavier. That's about a 10 or 11 gram, and that's a 3 or a 4 gram. Um, so how it works is on the reverse, you know, it's a very uh, dirty little variator. Don't judge me. But rollers slot into those little furrows, um, and of course they, they roll. Um, and those ramps vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. So personally, I like to work with the stock stuff because I kind of understand where the torque delivery is based on the movement or at least the shape of that curve. Um, aftermarket ones have a very uh, different torque curve that could be kind of 45 and then up or it's even or the ramps differ. So something to consider when you're buying aftermarket, they don't always work with the stock rollers and what's happening in the rear. And then at the rear, you've got your bell, and of course, this is your torque driver assembly. So in the center there, there should be a big spring, which is that sucker there. I've taken it off for the, uh, the purpose of this little tutorial. Um, and basically, the torque driver works in the opposite uh, kind of direction or the opposite principles, at least, to the, the variator. So the variator uses rollers to impart force onto the belt. Um, and this works in tension, whereas that spring keeps this outer plate, or this sliding sheave as it's called, um, at its outermost point. And then as the, the rollers impart force onto the variator, it basically pulls this section down. Um, and that'll be kind of second gear, where your belt is going to be all the way in the very bottom of the torque driver, and the very, very top section of the variator. You can see that wear mark there. That's kind of second gear. And then in between there is where we would normally kind of ride the bike. Um, so that's in essence how the CVT works, is it's basically imparting forces across rollers, belts, and of course the, the spring tension on the rear. All right, so let's say we want to modify the power delivery of our BWIS. Um, the first thing I would do is get yourself some, some lighter rollers and that's going to ensure that you have better acceleration. It is going to affect your um, your top speed because obviously the amount of force six light rollers can impart onto, onto that spring is only so much. So your top speed is going to be limited somewhat when you go lighter rollers. And of course, the, the opposite is true if you go heavier rollers. Um, you go heavier rollers, your, your pull-off is going to be decreased, but you'll get a much greater top speed because you're imparting a lot more force through the belt onto that spring. All right, um, now let's talk about springs themselves. So your torque driver spring, that's your stock spring, and that's a 2,000 RPM spring. So you can see it's slightly taller, um, not massively tall, but you can see the diameter of the spring material itself 
is much thicker on this sucker. Um, so if I try and squash them with my fingers, it takes a lot more force to move the 2000 RPM spring. Um, and up here in Johannesburg, we tend to run these 2000 RPM springs because for the primary reason is that we're limited with oxygen. So you're lucky down at the coast, you've got a lot more kind of power down low. We don't have that. So we compensate for uh, not having oxygen by having a 2000 RPM spring, which actually holds everything back and then engages much harder. All right, but there's more than one set of springs. So if I take this the torque driver apart, if I look at the on the reverse of this uh, clutch assembly, you can see the three springs here. Um, and the reason that says R is because it's Ryan, which was mine, when I loaned it to, to Kevin to make sure that we didn't kind of mix up each other's parts. So these springs here are 1,000 RPM springs. Uh, the standard springs are these little suckers here. Those are 500 RPM springs. And then ultimately, you pair that up with a 2000 RPM spring. And uh, the 2000, again, is what we run here. Because what it does is the centrifugal force uh, required to, to make these shoes actually engage onto the clutch bell is much greater. Uh, let me grab another bell and I'll show you what I mean. Or at least another assembly and I'll show you what I mean. So there's an assembly without any springs. Normally the springs would attach uh, in those two points, um, kind of there or thereabouts. Um, so they just move out ever so slightly to engage on the bell, which of course would get you to move forward. Um, so the reason we hold this back is, if you can imagine like a, if you're in your car and you're trying to race your mate uh, down the road and you're both at a, at, a, at a robot or something and you want to get a really fast pull off, you rev the car up a lot more and then of course you dump the clutch at like, you know, three or 4,000 RPM, that'll obviously get uh, you off the line much faster. And that's what these springs do. So this this is your your initial kind of off the line movement. It's controlled by these little springs on the, uh, the clutch assembly. And then uh, this also plays a big role in keeping you in first gear for longer. So if you can imagine you're racing your mate, you've continued, you got off the line really, really well. And of course, now what you want to do is you want to rev your car all the way out in first gear before hitting second gear. Because if you change it, you know, 4,000 RPM, you've wasted, let's just say your red line's at 2,000 RPM, you've wasted a further 2,000 revs, um, and your mate's going to kind of get ahead of you in your little race down the road. So I'm going to talk about the forces required. Like, just for you to assemble, or at least reassemble, this torque driver with this spring is going to require a huge amount of force um, to put that spring in there, and then to to compress this enough to actually get it located around those two areas and then get the nut on it. Huge amount of force required. So there's even more force required for your rollers to impart enough force to actually engage second gear. Um, and you would need at least, uh, you know, six, probably nine, 10, 11 gram rollers, depending on how strong the spring is, to actually ensure that you're maximizing the full rev range within first gear before second gear starts to get engaged. So I've spoken about how the red springs control uh, your power delivery. Um, and the reason little B-Wizzes go forever in standard form is because they, they're fairly unstressed. Um, you know, some, some B-Wizzes are known to be untouched for over 100,000 kilometers. That's because the standard springs are not really making the engine work too hard. Whereas the, those 2000 RPM springs are going to kind of cause failures in a hell of a lot less time. So it's something to consider, you know, when you want, when you, when you're modifying your bike is ultimately, what do you want from it? Um, you know, I asked myself that question and uh, I want a, a lot from my viewers. I'm quite a demanding rider. I'm 100 odd kgs. And I commute on it, so I want to get off the line really, really fast. You know, quicker than a lot of GTIs are off the line. Um, so that's why I've chosen to run 2,000 RPM springs, uh, because it makes the motor work so much harder, giving me all the power all the time. Of course, you know, if you want a bike to last you forever without any maintenance, 
this is what you want. You know, it's a kind of, it's kind of like driving Miss Daisy. You know, you're not racing your mate. You're kind of driving down the road very, very calmly, changing your, um, your gearbox or at least your gears in your car. You know, at 2,000, 3,000 RPM, your motor's revving, revving very, very low. So thus, the, the motor uh, is not going to give you any trouble because it's fairly unstressed in, in this format. So something to consider with regards to, to when you are choosing to modify your bike, you know, be honest with yourself, what do you want out of it? All right, so final little topic on the, the CBT of the BWIS is these things wear. Um, I mentioned earlier how uh, a 2000 RPM spring is gonna, uh, depending on its tension, would require a, a certain roller to impart a force greater uh, than the spring can actually withstand. So, the same thing is true with regards to standard springs. These springs at some point um, wear out. So for example, I can pair this spring with a fairly light roller setup to give me a similar uh, kind of maximizing first and second gear principles with a standard spring by running uh, you know, six very light rollers. Let's just say um, four grams uh, in uh, times six. So as this spring wears out because it, it literally wears it does this all the time as you're riding it and that will at some point fail um, which means that at some point your ideal setup is now going to require um, three slightly lighter rollers in that mix to ensure that this spring is being optimized uh, throughout its range within first and second gear um, i have a proverbial shed load of rollers uh, as they wear out. So as you can see I've got rollers here, a couple more there, a whole bunch in there, more there, i got a couple there, uh, other bag of rollers, uh, rollers, rollers, rollers um, and more rollers. Uh, so I'm constantly working on the tuning of my CVT to ensure that it's optimized based on the wear and tear, the setup, the power delivery of my bike. Um, and of course, that's my advice to you is um, be honest with yourself what you want with your bike and then get rollers to uh, to play around with um, and see what, what you like in the end. Little bonus feature is uh, you also get sliders nowadays. So that's something to consider as well with regards to, to power delivery. Um, this is a nice way to kind of cheat what's happening with your ramps um, as well you know you can run all six sliders or you can run three sliders and three rollers depending on the weight to yet again alter the power delivery um, and I mean depending on what pipe you've got for example I've got a POD pipe on my bike or on my bikes and uh, that's that it requires fairly light rollers um, to ensure that your power band uh, which is quite high, is actually being utilized. Otherwise, you pull off and you're doing, you know, 20 k's an hour, you know, 25 k's an hour, 26 k's an hour. It just takes too long to get there with a tuned pipe. Um, that's the beauty of all these rollers is I can tune my power delivery and all my setup based on uh, the current specification of my bike. Um, so kind of parting thought is tune your bike with some rollers. You will have a field day with them. So last thought, if you're battling with rollers, um, trying to get them, Yamaha does keep. Uh, these are actually off a Yamaha Nitro 100. Uh, they're fairly heavy, these are 12 grams. Um, then of course, Beewers, I think are around eight or nine grams. And then a Yamaha Jock 90 and a Jock 50 are um, six and four grams. So between the combination of those four bikes, you should be able to get uh, a setup that works for you. Um, these are 15 by 12 millimeters um, and of course you can import some if you'd like uh, if you don't want to go to Yamaha they are fairly expensive our dear friends at Yamaha um, but ultimately you know we live in the arse end of Africa and getting stock uh, and getting shipping from overseas often proves tricky so good luck with whatever you choose to do.